Hello, welcome back. What a, what a room we got here. Um, I promise it's your last time in it, but we're gonna leave you really excited. So um, welcome to what we're calling our Democracy Spark session, which is a little bit more ambiguous than our very thoughtfully crafted other session titles. Uh, but as we planned this conference, we wanted to create a space for really, truly innovative ideas to be shared. We asked these folks um, that we're about to hear from what innovative idea would spark a change that would revolutionize how our society operates, how we think or what we believe. We asked them to be creative. What idea, either imagined or actualized, could ignite sparks of creativity and possibility for our conference attendees to think differently about the world as it should be? To have everyone leave on fire to make the changes that they want to see. We asked them also very specifically that they had five minutes each to do this. Um, but over the last few years, as I'm, sure, as I'm sure many of you have had this experience, I've had the blessing of relearning things through the eyes of my two and three-year-old. Um, so the other day, my three-year-old asked me, you know, when she's going to get her magic powers. Um, because, you know, some of her favorite people have magic powers, Moana, Elsa, Abby Kadabi. Um, I feel like it was appropriate that our poets this morning started us off, started us off with magic. Um, so she's in that sort of beautiful space where she can't really tell the difference sometimes between reality, like what is actual and real, and what is imaginary. So I had the choice, you know, to crush her spirit um, and really just ground her in the real world and what she can see with her eyes. Um, or I could present this to a room full of conference attendees, you know, to try to remember um, what it felt like or what it could possibly be, you know, before someone told you that something imaginary didn't exist. Um, but also to practice not limiting what we think is possible to what we see in front of us. So here we are. <clears throat> I think that sometimes we, and I include myself in this category um, as an official old person, I don't know what generation I'm considered, but definitely older, um, we often get bogged down, sometimes jaded. We become limited in our admittedly narrow worlds as they are. We just try to make it through the day sometimes. At some point, we stop asking why and why. Why? Because why? 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 and we sort of lose that sense of creativity, curiosity, and imagination. These terms tend to get a bad rap sometimes in academic circles, and sometimes in serious spaces like conferences. But I would argue, and our team would argue, that curiosity is not merely a passive quality. It's an active spark that ignites creativity and can change the world. So with that, I have the honor to pass it over to Jillian Hainsworth, who's gonna be emceeing our Sparks Talks. Jillian is, and this feels really incredible to say, but I don't think anyone is surprised, an Emmy Award winning. Woo! <laughs> Spoken word artist, the poet laureate emeritus, first of Buffalo, New York. I, again, we heard from, I think, some of our future ones earlier today. Um, was recognized as a High Road Builder in 2022 from our High Road Fellowship cohort and is a community organizer and activist. She was born and raised on the east side of Buffalo where she developed a vision to use art and advocacy to help her community reimagine justice and work together to create a system where all people can thrive. Currently, she travels the country performing poetry and speaking on various topics, including art for activism, impacts of storytelling, and the importance of honest and critical social and political conversations. In addition, she oversees Buffalo Books, a nationally recognized program which aims to improve access to culturally relevant books for residents of the east side of Buffalo with the hopes of helping to increase literacy rates among black and brown communities. So with that, I'll pass it over to Jillian. Thank you. All right, how we doing? That sounds like y'all doing all right. How y'all doing? Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, so I'm happy to be here. Before our Democracy Spark segment, I'm going to talk just for a second. 
not long, um, and do a couple poems if that's okay. Um, so I am from Buffalo, born and raised on the east side, Kensington Bailey to be specific. Um, I am an uptown girl. Um, when I was a kid, I started writing. I started writing songs when I was seven, poetry when I was nine. The songs were awful. They sounded like a seven-year-old wrote them. <laughs> but my mom would let me teach her these songs while she was getting her makeup ready for work or church. She was our worship leader at church. So my songs, I'm like, I'm gonna teach you this song. It's gonna be amazing. You're gonna do it in church. Everybody's gonna be crying. And that's how I win. <laughs> um, the songs were very goofy, but I always like to credit my mom because she never laughed at me. Like she never said, Jill, you can't say that word in church. Or she never said, that's just not good. <laughs> like it's not good. Um, she always let me teach her. She took me very seriously. When I tried to publish my first book, The Princess Who Lost Her Crown, um, about this princess who could not find her crown and she was looking everywhere, she finally found it and she wasn't late to her grandmother's funeral. She didn't say, why are you so dark? Like, why did this story end that way? She took it seriously. Um, I credit her for everything I do today because if a black girl being raised in poverty on the east side of Buffalo who has a learning disability and has gone to seven different schools were to walk into a room full of people and say, I'm gonna win an Emmy one day as a writer, they probably would not have taken that very seriously, but my mom always did. So I say that to say that when we're coming up with ideas of what it means to reimagine our community, deciding how our community can actually operate for us, and we hear these out-of-the-box ideas, consider taking them seriously. Like, consider actually listening. Consider not laughing when someone says, we can have a community that's not over-policed. Take that seriously. Because we've normalized a lot of these systems and a lot, the way they function in our lives to the point where when we imagine them not functioning that way, it almost sounds silly. It almost sounds unbelievable. But it's not. Take it from me, <laughs> it's not. So I wanted to just say that a little bit. Um, as a poet now, when I, when I went to City Hall and said we need a poet laureate in Buffalo, it was because I know how important it is for us as community members to hold our collective story and our collective narrative. We cannot give that away. We can't give it to our politicians. We can't give it to other people to determine how we speak about our community, the demands we need from our community, and how we approach that. So that is why we have a Poet Laureate role now in Buffalo. And I'm honored that I was the first, but I'm even more excited that I'm not the Poet Laureate anymore. <laughs> I don't mean that in a shady way. <laughs> it's because now there's a new voice. And then in a couple years, there's gonna be another new voice with new ideas. And as we continue to see new Poet Laureates, and one day, hopefully the poets you saw this morning step into that role, yeah. <laughs> they're gonna reimagine it. And they're gonna do something with it that when we hear about it, we might say, that's unconventional, or that's silly, but let's take them seriously. Let's take them seriously every single time. So, okay, I said that. I'm gonna do a couple poems if that's okay. Um, this first one, <laughs> this first one is called Morning Until Morning. It was written for Before and After Again, which is an exhibition that's open right now at AKG. It's open until October 12th. Um, so if you haven't gone to see it, it is free to the community, um, and it was cre curated by Erin Ott and then created by myself, Julia Bottoms, who's amazing, and then Tiffany Gaines, who's a curator right here at the Birchville. So this poem is called Morning Until Morning, and I am going to ask that at the end, in lieu of an applause, you join me in a moment of silence to remember all of our community members that we've lost, um, especially the ones that we lost on May 14th of 2022. In the morning, when we rise, give us freedom. Give us a rhythm to dance to and a light bright enough to eliminate the hurt. Give us a new reason and a why, a new sky without a cloud in sight. In the morning, give us healing. Turn the sadness into acceptance and the acceptance into ammunition. Take the fire from around us and place it within us. Give us the boldness to burn it all down to protect our own. In the morning, when we rise, Dry our weeping eyes. 
Let each tear water plants of purpose. Allow hope for tomorrow to sprout from our dampened land, a land stained with the blood of our ancestors. Let us become their legacy, finishing the works they began and beginning new works with their vision in mind. In the morning, let us rise. Let our legs soar from marching, our knees bruised from praying, our minds weary from worrying, all find a peace beyond our own understanding. And even while in the thick of it, give us the encouragement needed to remember that tomorrow is on its way. Give us the wisdom to know when to rise. But until that time, we'll be mourning until morning. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple more and I'm gonna get out of y'all way. Are y'all ready? Yes. Nervous? Period, nobody's nervous. <laughs> Cause for what, right, for what? Why be nervous when you are presenting new ways to reimagine our community? That's exciting. Um, this first poem is, um, shout out to Sam McGavern, where is he? Oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, Sam pulled me in on this project um, inspired by Walt Whitman's work. Um, so this first poem is called Inevit The Inevitable Us and it was written in a response to a series of Walt Whitman quotes. Um, so I'll start that one. Inevitable, certain to happen or unavoidable. Like good things being attracted to good people like magnets or goodbyes after a long day or a long life or a long fight, you were inevitable and because you have been intertwined with me, so am I. Your words speak to me, leaving me with a familiar aftertaste as if I knew them inherently. Forwards and backwards, they exist within me too. You are an oxymoron to me. Something like a well-known stranger or singing along word for word to a song I've never heard, an unsettling comfort. You are a living, breathing contradiction. A combination of statements, ideas, or features that are opposed to one another, like how sometimes it is in death that we find new life and how even through the pain, we celebrate. We smile through sorrowful tears, leaving trails of salt where the memories lay, both leaving you be and carrying you with us wherever we may go, inevitably existing, contradicting what I understand. You fill me with the knowledge that I know nothing, challenging me to breathe with the wind and grow with the grass and shed with the trees and cry with the clouds. I will always seek you out. For it is within your wind and your grass that I learned to survive. Under my boots where I found you, I found a stone that I used to slay my Goliath. You taught me that I am David. I am Shadrach emerging from the furnace unscathed. I am large too. I am also a product of the multitudes I contain. I come from it and I am cut from it from you. From the people in the living world, from everything around me and even the things I barely knew, I exist to exist for you. I fight to live for you. You are my family and my worst enemy, my biggest fear and my most precious thing. You are true justice, both honest and fair. Injustice within itself is a contradiction, another something to try to understand, to attempt to wrap my untamed mind around. I build you up to lean on you. I glean from you and beam for you, and even in this moment, I feel you. All of your power and your deafening silence, your bigness keeps me up at night. Big words and big wars leading to big wins. I am big within, too, and it's because of you, the inevitable you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to bring up our first presenter. So when I present, when I bring up our presenters, I'm not going to bury the lead, okay? I'm not going to tell you exactly what they're going to be doing because that's for them. So first, can we bring up Lily Karras, who is the project director for Western New York Area Labor Federation? Let's give Lily a round of applause. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lillian Karras. Let me get my slides going. My name is Lillian Karras, and I am speaking today on behalf of the Western New York Area Labor Federation, AFL-CIO. 
where I have the privilege to serve as the project director for our Worker Empowerment Center project. I'm so excited to be here speaking today just to share a little bit about the visioning process behind our Worker Empowerment Center project and later on reflect on our first pilot program under the Worker Empowerment Center name. We have spent the last two years working with workers and labor leaders around the region to envision what an organized labor-sponsored worker center could look like. After stakeholder interviews, focus groups, and hundreds of conversations with non-union workers, rank-and-file union members, and labor leaders, we've developed a vision for the lane we're trying to fill in the region. There are three parts of the vision that I'd like to uplift today. We know that labor is community, and community is labor. We want to bridge gaps between organized labor and the broader Western New York community by ensuring that all working people have the information necessary to access a high-quality union job with family-sustaining wages and benefits. Um, at the ELF, we believe that diversity is our strength and power. We want to ensure that the demographics of the labor movement and labor leadership reflect the diversity of our region, thinking specifically about race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and ability. A second component of our vision, we believe in the power of proximity. We envision a brick and mortar worker center that can serve as a hub for both programming and community building. Lastly, we seek to blend traditional workforce development practices and program formats with organized labor's values and education framework. Um, you know, we come to the space with an acknowledgement that, you know, the idea of a worker center is kind of new for us in organized labor. Uh, for those who might not know too much about the Western New York Area Labor Federation or the ELF, um, our role has historically been to serve our 140 affiliate unions and the 140,000 active members and retirees that our affiliate members serve. We do this through running federated campaigns um, from the, you know, the Federation of Union sides, supporting our affiliate unions campaigns, and engaging in political work on behalf of organized labor. I want to talk a little bit about what worker centers are and why this idea of an organized labor, an organized labor-sponsored worker center is kind of so new in the region. Um, worker centers have not always been viewed as compatible with organized labor. Um, many worker centers formed from workers who are, have been ex explicitly excluded from um, forming unions. I'm um, thinking about farm workers, domestic workers. Um, worker centers are community-based and often centered around an identity group. Um, when we think of some of the earliest examples of worker centers, you know, I think of black workers coming together to form worker centers in the Carolinas um, to support each other's material need. Um, I think about immigrant workers coming together to support each other's needs and promote policy um, in major, major hubs. Um, you might recognize some of these logos, uh, the Tompkins County Worker Center, some of us might be familiar with in Ithaca, New York. Um, but we envision a worker center that will offer a menu of programming to support workers as they find their way along a union career path. We're thinking about labor education, school-based school labor education, community-based labor education, labor education that takes place in a program that folks might already be a part of. Um, we're envisioning workers' rights trainings. Um, we're even thinking about what it might look like to have you know, adapted case management to help support workers with common barriers to sustaining employment um, things like navigating childcare, things like navigating transportation. Uh, we also plan or vision uh, to run and support campaigns for pro-worker, pro-labor policy. We'd love to give you, you know, just an example of one such program from our envisioned menu of programming. Uh, last fall, we were so proud to launch the first pilot program under the Worker Empowerment Center name. Um, this was a school-based labor education program at the Erie One Boces Edge Academy um, on East Elevin. Um, and we were really excited to work with this school um, because some teachers reached out to us seeking resources for their students. Uh, they knew that many of their students were wanting to go right into the workforce, were not interested in college, and these teachers knew that a union job would help these students find their way. So in collaboration with eight of our affiliate unions, um, including Grace, who some of you might met yesterday on the labor panel, um, we designed a program to connect high school students with union reps for um, educational presentations, one-to-one -one conversations, and experiential learning so that students could have a chance to see if this is work that they would actually like to do for the rest of their lives. Uh, we really wanted to showcase the union difference. Um, you know, what it really means for households to have, you know, family sustaining wages and high quality benefits. Um, you know, things that allow families and communities to thrive. And most importantly, we wanted to build relationships with students and job seekers and help them find their way 
help them identify those first few steps into um, you know, being a union member. I've got a few photos up um, just to show these are some of the students that we worked with at the Erie One Boces Edge Academy. Um, like I mentioned, our eight affiliate unions really were able to showcase their own you know, individual style for labor education. Some folks brought virtual reality simulators. Um, you can see some of the students with the headsets um, to the left. That's one of our students, Sophia, um, who was putting on the headset um, and pretending that she, or simulating the experience of being a laborer um, working on a project on a roof. Um, that simulated experience was developed from real footage from a project um, in Syracuse, New York. We are really excited about the potential of um, this type of programming that could take place at a center and, and really beyond. And we've heard some really positive feedback from the students. Um, we heard students say, I'm learning to set myself up for success. You know, I'm learning what the union difference is. I'm learning how these benefits could change my life and my family's life. Um, and we wanted to kind of end on this note um, just to showcase that, you know, we're hearing from the folks who would actually be, you know, at the center, attending such programming, um, and constantly, you know, thinking about what their lived experience, what their perspective will be in order to inform all of our future development. So if what I talked about interested you today, or you'd like to keep following along, uh, you know, please feel free to get in touch. I love to talk about this work, and I'm always eager to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your time today. So next we're going to have Unai Reglaro to talk about something that is obviously near and dear to my heart. So let's give Unai a big round of applause. Um, hello everyone, uh, I'm Unai Reglaro. I'm, I have been working with PPG the last two years as a result of the Creative Reveal New York Employment Program. And I'm from Spain but I have been living a lot of years in Colombia before coming to Buffalo five years ago. So English is not my first language, but I will do my best. Mm -hmm. So what is the role of art in a wall on fire, you know, in a world where war, genocide, fascism, climate catastrophe, it's in our reality, no? Can our practices be the catalyst for a radical political imagination? These are questions that we ask ourselves in our collective, Caldo de Cultivo, a collective that I share with my partner, Gabriela, that is there, and now with my daughter too, Ainara. <laughs> and we come from this tradition that we understand art as a tool, but also as a weapon, you know, to fight in the cultural war, you know? as a hammer, you know, as we can see in this poster from May of 68. And our practice can be named as a counter-propaganda, you know, a, a type of dissensual propaganda that frontally attacks the doxa defended by the hegemonic forces. Okay, as we have very little time, I'm gonna just share three tips with three projects. First of all is agitate. Uh, you can do it in a very simple way, just with, an, <laughs> with a subversive affirmation. Everything is going to be all right, an intervention in a bookstore here in Buffalo, in Fitzbooks, a campaign with a curatorship of books that explain the rise of fascism. And, you know, the books is, are the image of a rabid dog, but the books are themselves the antidote. This is a project from 20, 2020, but it could be from today, you know? Second, propagate. Here it comes, the uh, counter-propaganda, you know? This is the abolitionist artifact, a mobile device designed to inhabit the streets and to be used by activists in protests and demonstrations to fight the, the mass incarceration, yeah? You can compose a slogans, abolitionist slogans here, you know? And invite the public to interact with the language of abolition, take collective action, and imagine abolitionist futures. And third, organize. I don't have to explain to you what, what it means to organize. So, but I'm gonna talk about the 
pre-enactment, the pre-enactment, not to re-enact, but pre-enact. That it means to uh, create a political event that we can, that we want to see in the future. No, in this case, there was a very complex context. Uh, a huge massacre going on in Colombia in 2018, where activists and social leaders were being assassinated. Uh, there was a far-right government, and they killed 700 activists in two years. In that context, we were invited to propose a project for an um, international biennial in the city of Cali, and we decided to Can we put the play here? Okay, okay, there it is. So we decided to occupy uh, an emblematic sports arena with the struggles of the people. And we convert this, this uh, sports arena in a, in a training space for the social struggle and, and a popular parliament, yeah. So here there were the, the black struggles, the campesinos struggles, the unions struggles, the feminist struggles, all together in this training. Yeah. So what happened is after this, uh, two years after, there, there was a massive strike in Colombia, all the struggles together stopped the country, and two years after, they create a, a coalition of all the struggles, and they took the presidency of Colombia. Being this, <laughs> so this is this is Francia Marquez, the first black woman vice president of a country in South America, and she was for years before in the coalition of the people. Okay, and to finish, fiat ars perean mundus, let art be done though the world would perish. This is a quote by Walter Benjamin, uh, written 100 years ago, to criticize the complicit role of, of, some, of some artistic practices with the rise of fascism, in a situation very, very similar to the situation that we have right now. So, Walter Benjamin was arguing that uh, we have to be very careful with the aesthetification of politics, and he argues for the politicization of aesthetics. No? So, this is a project in process. I don't know really, really well what to do with that, but this is an idea to create a, a signpost in the public space and maybe with a, with a inifug material that can be fired if the wall is so hot. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what we have learned in all these years of practice is that art may be not enough and that we really need the, the coalition of all the struggles to work together to fight fascism nowadays, and that are the best that can do is to provide the struggles with the semiotic uh, ammunition to fight in the cultural war. And this is all I have for today. Thank you so much. <laughs> That was amazing. Um, so as a proud um, resident business of the Foundry, anything our next speaker says, I 1,000% agree. Um, so please give Megan McNally a big round of applause, the executive director of the Foundry. I feel like now I have to say something crazy so that Jillian just nods and <laughs> agrees. Um, Thank you all for having me today. Um, so as Jillian said, I'm from the Foundry. I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, in particular, I am wanting to share with you Foundry Made. So it's an initiative at the Foundry. It's um, 
employment-based workforce development program that builds cool stuff um, for our community uh, through streetscape improvement. Um, and really that driver and, and end goal is to develop more neighborhood wealth. So across workforce development and you know, making our communities brighter and cooler and more enjoyable. Uh, so what is the Foundry? Uh, the Foundry is a mix of business incubation. So we do business incubation support services, one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship. Uh, we have a whole slate of youth education um, and workforce development, and it all centers around being makers. Uh, uh, we have a wood shop, metal shop, textile, and tech lab, all sorts of cool tools um, that we can make stuff with. Um, so in our workforce development programs, we're focusing, um, we do actually do younger folks as well, but uh, for this particular, for Foundry Made, it's focused on 18 and up because, you know, Department of Labor, we don't want uh, younger kids cutting their hands off. Um, so we run workforce development programs that are teaching about career options in different industries, about safety, production processes, um, all sorts of workplace readiness. Um, and some skill development in metal, wood, fabrication, digital design. Um, and ultimately, uh, through that process, they can get placed in Foundry Made, where they are employed part-time by us to fabricate uh, items for the community, or we get them uh, placed in paid internships and employment opportunities out with area fabricators and manufacturers. Um, so these are just some images of students learning and making and some projects that we've made. Um, so talk a little bit about streetscape improvement. Some of the like, you know, traditional crime prevention through environmental design, um, you know, can be great uh, if it's implemented correctly, but we want to really elevate that the um, community support and ownership is primary to that process. So, you know, if it's coming from top down and it's just like, this is going to fix our community. As we know, that doesn't really work. Um, but if it's implemented properly, um, you know, but and having community buy-in, it can really uh, impact um, you know, how we feel and how we operate in our communities safely. Um, that's just a, sorry, that's a ribbon cutting for one of our student programs and you know, hosted by a Riverside Black Rock Business Association. We built some benches for them. So it's all um, in with community doing designs for and with the community. Um, so here's some examples across uh, the city. We actually have a Google map of all the stuff that we've made. We're going to do like a uh, scavenger hunt someday. Um, so we do a lot of benches and tables. Um, metal fabrication, wood fabrication is primary to that. You know, you can see the differences um, because, you know, community had input. It's not just all the same. Um, and just different spaces across the city. Um, we've actually worked with Jillian, so... Um, to do a bunch of little libraries, so that can really build literacy, but you know, I always see kids and families out. We have a little library in front of the foundry. People are checking it out. Um, really important to just build in some of those quality of life things that you know, make our, our communities unique. Um, we built, we just actually finished 22 bike racks that are across the um, community in different community centers. You can see one of those pictures is at Martha Mitchell Community Center, bright, pink, uh, bright orange colored one. So if you see any orange ones, they're probably ours, because um, who makes orange bike racks? Um, but that's the fun of it. You know, it's some of that art, artistic piece. So again, that like, you could just build a bike rack, but if you build a cool bike rack that people really like, um, you know, it just elevates it that more. And employing people to do that, um, that are part of our community is really important. Um, how does that generate neighborhood wealth? You know, we're building higher skilled workforce that can earn living wages. Um, we pay all of our youth, um, and they're also really proud of the stuff that they do, right? So they can go out and show their families what they make, um, and, you know, it, it's really about change perception. So all, all of those pictures you can see, we do ribbon cuttings. There's always media there. And so, you know, of our communities, oftentimes we get, you know, the, the not-so-great news. Um, we're always ones to have the great news um, happening in our communities and that the youth can stand up and they can talk about how proud they are of the work that they do. Um, one of those pictures showed the bike racks. We were in front of like 75 people who were cheering the kids on. So, you know, really helping people, um, young people, understand that they have the capacity to change uh, their neighborhoods um, is really powerful. Um, so what makes a project a good fit, if anybody's interested in doing work with us? Um, we've recognized that making multiples of things is really important. Doing some basic tasks, so stuff that's not super hard, 
um, is really important um, because we want our students to really practice, um, ready to build projects. So, you know, we do, we have done all sorts of public art stuff as well, but um, we're really focused on how do we do a production process so that we can provide the maximum benefit for our community. Um, and so it can't be too out there. Uh, and, you know, just having that community buy-in is really important to us. Uh, last slide, uh, you know, how to make this happen, it really just starts with community investment, so leveraging different sponsors, um, you know, council districts, we've often had um, community partners come to us and say, you know, we want a, a sign or something made for us, uh, you know, let's just talk to the council member and see if we can make that happen. So, you know, it's, it's a blend of um, getting the funding, getting the community buy-in, having uh, the young people ready and willing to make stuff. Um, and all of those things coming together is really um, what makes it a powerful opportunity. Get making. <laughs>Thank you, Megan. Uh, Dana, remind me where you're in town from. I'm sorry? Remind me where you're in town from. Oh, from Austin. From Austin. Every time people come to Buffalo, regardless of if they're from here or not, I'm always like, I really hope the weather doesn't embarrass us. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I know this weather is subjective, but I'm a little embarrassed because it's too hot. <laughs> I'm trying not to complain. But it's hot, y'all. I don't, I don't like it. Okay, next up, we're going to bring Dana Bowerly McKnight. Let's give her a big round of applause. Wow, hi, everybody. Um, so I am from Buffalo originally. I've been um, a space maker for the past 15, 20 years. First starting making space at my apartment on Trinity called the Night House which was a DIY musical space. Um, and then second was Dreamland, uh, see, look, yay, uh, which was a DIY contemporary art space as well as music space run by myself and a magical cavalcade of other human beings. Um, and it became a very important space for holding space for other collectives as well, uh, for first time projects, um, whether it was via organization or in the arts. So I am a very analog person, so we will see how this, okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, I would like to talk about speculative fiction for real world building. Um, speculative fiction has always been a very important part of my life as a writer, a poet, and also a little bit of an anarchist um, where I would generally generate and create my own work without like any sort of backing. Um, so I made this massive thingy, um, but we're just going to cut it in half for time. Um, <laughs> who knows what uh, the third space is? Raise your hand if you know what a third space is. Perfect. So I'll just run through for everyone who doesn't know. Um, first space is going to be your home. Second space is work. Third space is a bar, a coffee shop. It's going to be your community church uh, programming after service. Um, it's generally, it's like an intentional space for people to hang out, gather. Overwhelmingly, third spaces um, are still uh, profit makers. <laughs> so um, their entire purpose is still to make a dollar, even though people are commuting. Um, the, we're just going to skip through this shit. One second. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. So the fourth space is pretty new. Uh, came out in 2016-ish. And it was basically created by tech bros who wanted to harness the power of the DIY um, squat hippie commune, but apply it for maximum capitalist output. So live, work, play, you have your cereal dispenser, you know, um, and you're basically working 14 hours and then going to sleep in a little pod. San Francisco has a ton of them. A lot of them have failed uh, just because they were overly expensive. People were hyper depressed in these spaces, obviously. Um, and it was a failure. So uh, we are now going to posit the fifth space, which I believe hasn't been talked about or created yet. So we're going to do that right now. So the fifth space is Immersive environments primarily created by artists for the sake of imaginative world building. Um, so 
is creating a setting specifically designed for intentional creative adult play while using speculative fiction as its core basis. So unlike the fourth space, the fifth space is entirely not for profit and intended to create a temporary autonomous zone entirely for the sake of interpersonal speculative imagination. So these spaces are almost always, they have to be designed by artists in order for it to be a fifth space. So Disneyland doesn't count because it's for profit. So um, in Austin, Texas, uh, where I moved to um, because I was burned out, uh, I created in 2020 the Tiny Minotaur. So um, created in direct response to COVID as a space of intentional adult play, the Tiny Minotaur was a large immersive walkthrough art installation, micro theater and performance space rooted in a homebrewed world called Karth, which I created. Uh, which is a pre-industrial fantasy world accessible to our world Earth by accidentally falling into a pocket dimension called the Rift, which connected both worlds. So patrons would enter the Rift by way of online reservation, party of six, COVID friendly, um, and proceed to embark on guided quests with myself and two other actors. And participants were encouraged to dress up and embody their own characters, a process that led to full immersion. So the Tiny Minotaur was created specifically uh, under the premise that Fantasy is not escapism, but respite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for us, as specifically a black queer person, creating respite, uh, and especially in a space like Texas, which is a full-on authoritarian state, if you haven't noticed yet, uh, having respite space um, rooted in fantasy for creative play is extremely important. So after two years of sold out reservations um, and participants who would come to the Tiny Minotaur multiple times, we ended up expanding. So we evolved beyond the micro theater to a fully fledged immersive private club designed by myself and made real with the help of dozens of local artists, fabricators, textile artists, muralists, performers. And when we say private club, we said we created a private club very specifically for what we like to call discernible gatekeeping. So discernible gatekeeping means not everyone coming off the street can come in, specifically douchey tech bros, which are prevalent throughout all of Austin. Um, anyone who is coming in with like, you know, the intent to create bad energy, bad vibes to disrupt, so to speak. Um, and this is a very por important for us um, as a space that is working to be as safe as possible for black and brown people, trans people, femmes, anyone outside in the marginalized sectors that are most affected by Texas policies. So beyond micro theater and quests, uh, the Tiny Minotaur now hosts multiple events a month, including workshops. We have a knife fighting workshop, uh, which is under the guise of our rogues guild, but it's actual true knife fighting skills uh, that we basically show femmes and queers very specifically how to fend off a knife attack. Um, Concerts, drag shows, readings, burlesque. Uh, we have artists and vendor markets where all of the artists keep all of their proceeds that they make. Uh, fantasy karaoke, free entry Wednesdays for service industry workers. And to this day, the Tiny Minotaur runs entirely on public donations and not really city grants because we were doing it before we got like a teeny little city grant. Um, we have no investors, we have no bank loans, and uh, our workers are paid over the living wage. Thank you. And one of the bigger questions we asked ourselves when we were creating this space was, there's a need for fantasy space, uh, specifically in Texas, but also what does a world look like without colonization? And when we're building worlds, very specifically in the world of CARF, there isn't colonization, um, very unlike anything that's happening obviously on our plane of existence. Um, what does a world look like without Christianity or Islam or Judaism or monotheism as a general? Um, how do you roll through worlds um, with like an upholded uh, honor and moral code? Um, what does a world look like without white people? That doesn't mean like non-melanated people aren't there, but whiteness as a construct isn't in this world. What does it mean to not have the concept of blackness, which was created as a construct in lieu of whiteness and colonialism? And the Tiny Minotaur does all of these things in real time. So we're gonna go through here. Bah, bah, bah. So we created an elven temple. <laughs> uh, and in the midst of it, we have tons of performers. Um, a few weeks ago, Imole, which was a black fey day, um, imagined by a beautiful cavalcade of 
black and brown and queer like drag performers. And the concept of it was an immersive mini play in this temple uh, where they were this mystical alien god species that had come and were utilizing sight, touch, sound, and various uh, elements of performance uh, to bring a crowd outside of their bodies a little bit. Um, we used <laughs> an old school D&D map making um, apparatus to actually make the site, and it is actually identical to what you see here, even though the, the hollows are upside down. So this is one of the installations on site. There's over 15 walk-in, sit-down installations. Um, overwhelmingly, the space has been created um, very, very specifically as a way station between worlds. So it's like a bus stop, or very much so if you uh, can't afford <laughs> you know, a one-way like flight and you have to do a transfer, um, you are coming into this world uh, before you're going to your next destination, which opens like massive realms of play for people. And here is a little bit more of temple scenery. Uh, we have pretty much living walls all throughout the space. Um, we've planted over a quarter of an acre of bamboo, Carolina sapphires, tons of indigenous plants local to the area after dropping three feet of topsoil down. And we actually have one of the most robust gardens in the entire city of Austin. And the ecology of it is in Unbelievable. Like we've got uh, over 30 butterfly species that are coming through. Um, it's wild. Some of our patrons watching uh, a drag show that's happening on site. Just gonna skip through really quick. And I'm just gonna go through a few of our patrons. It's extraordinarily diverse on site. And I will say that 60% of our patrons are our organizers. So we have Vocal Texas on site. Um, we also have Texas Harm Reduction Alliance, which is one of the only needle exchange programs in Texas um, that is actively like overturning a lot of the crisis that's happening um, with fentanyl and xylazine right now. Um, also SWAP, which is a sex workers union, uh, comes through on Wednesdays and they have like pure play space. It's a private club, but we have a lot of unhoused members who get free membership, and we keep that secret so that they can come and enjoy the space in dignity. Over here, we have one of our bards. <laughs> you see his little Casio. Um, he comes in, and he makes songs up on the fly for any patrons that come through. The woman in the middle, um, she <laughs> makes cursed treats, but she's a master baker who used to work for a James Beard awarded bakery and she just comes through and hands out free candied apples that she made from scratch. And I will say that is the best candy apple I've ever had in my life. And I'm diabetic, I'm not supposed to eat it, but I did. <laughs> and on the left is Gothis Jasmine, loco, they, them, drag performer, black, absolutely magnificent, and they've put on tons of programming. They also organize black and brown performers specifically in Austin which is a very, very difficult thing to do with Austin's massive uh, push out of black and brown bodies with its rampant like, gentrification. So the Tiny Minotaur is located on the east side of Austin in the heart of the city and it is 100% hidden. So whatever magical abilities we've done to make that happen, people walk by and have no idea what's inside, but it's all been word of mouth. And overwhelmingly the people that are coming in are us. And we want to encourage I'm just gonna leave with this. Um, it is very easy to make space if you have the energy and the drive to do it. You don't need to have a ridiculous amount of money. You can do it out of your house. And you just need to think really truly what your community needs in this moment. For me, I went from um, full street activism and street medic work to doing very hyper respite space, which as recharge stations, and if you can act and think really truly what your community needs, even if it's just a weekly potluck, very simple. These things are extraordinarily important for keeping the energy going for doing this fight, and it's gonna get worse. So we need to make sure we're taking care of ourselves and allowing ourselves time to play, time to frolic, and it's a necessity. And that's all, thank you. All right, that was amazing. 
I need to go to Austin in, in the winter, not in the summer, clearly. Okay, so next up, we are gonna bring up someone who I love so much. Um, so I want you to give her a big round of applause because I love her. Um, Dr. Leah Angel Daniel, who is the founder of Fostering Greatness and the executive director of the African American Cultural Center. Thank you, Jillian, and I love you too. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. So some of you I met yesterday evening at the African American Cultural Center um, for your field trip with Dr. Taylor. So I hope you all still remember that great food from TNC Catering. And um, so today I am coming in the capacity of the organization that I founded and am also the executive director of Fostering Greatness, Inc. This is a nonprofit organization that assists foster care youth, young adults, and alumni of color who have transitioned out of the foster care system. I'm not sure how many of you know much about the foster care system, but it is a system where young people most of the time feel disposed of, unloved, unworthy, left out, and forgotten. When people look at me today, they say, um, why did you get involved with something like this? And I say, I am an alumni of the foster care system. And the response is, they say, you don't look like you've gone through the foster care system. And I say, what do people who have gone through the foster care system look like? And so again, that perceived way of thinking that those who have come through the system cannot be the best of the best, meaning whatever that is to them. So we wanted to change that narrative. And so that has been a slogan that has completely gone through um, the invention of this nonprofit organization, the livelihood of it, and it's called changing the narrative. What you think you know may not be the truth. What you have learned growing up may not be the truth for others. And changing the narrative is a challenge. Are you ready? Are you willing? And are you open to do something different, to think something different, and to be something different for people who need you? So just a little bit of statistical information about um, those who have been in the foster care system. Nationwide, there are over 400,000 youth who are in the foster care system. And they're considered wards of the state. So wards of the state means that we, as citizens in each state, are responsible for them. 20,000 of these youth age out each year. And when we say age out, they leave the system between the ages of 18 and 21. And I want you all to think, when you were between the ages of 18 and 21, did you feel like you were really prepared for life? Like when I say prepared, meaning having the down payment for your apartment, having life set all out, having it planned all out, knowing what you were going to be and what you were going to do for that next year, all of these different adult things. I'm in my 40s right now, and sometimes I even have to think about, you know, what am I doing in the next six months? What am I, what am I um, going to do? Where am I going to be? But the expectation for these young people is that they have it all figured out. And the word that is used for that is adultification. And a lot of times this falls upon black females who have gone through the foster care system. 25% um, of these young people will not receive a high school diploma. 50% will develop a substance addiction, 20% will become homeless, 50% will be unemployed despite having a high school diploma or GED, and I was one of those who had a college degree who found myself homeless at 21. 13 degree will receive a college degree, and many more will have to depend on government assistance, and that's 70%, and the lack of access to vital supports for this population is 10 times more, more likely to make them homeless, to participate in at-risk behaviors, to be in domestic violence situations, to be human sex trafficked, and the list goes on and on. 
So when I saw these statistics, I said, okay, people think that this is going to happen to each and every one of the young people that leave the foster care system. How do we change it? What do we need to do? And so I began to think about my life and what helped me to stay on the path that I was on. And for me, education was my jam. I love to learn, y'all. I love to just be in the midst of um, people who just wanted to share things. And I went to school to become a news anchor. I was very nosy. I love to people, be in people's business, know their stories, and that gave me life. I went to a performing arts high school. I love to act. It's just everything that could take me away from the reality of my own life helped me to flourish in other areas. So I went on to school, uh, went on to get my bachelor's and my master's, and I ended up getting a job in Burbank, California at Warner Brothers um, at the Mario Lopez show and had to decline the job because I had to come back to Buffalo to get the rest of my siblings who were in foster care. My one brother who I particularly came back for had two failed adoptions. He was legally blind and he had been placed in a psychiatric center where he was violated. And I wanted him to know at the age of 12 that somebody loved him, that there was somebody there for him, and he would have a chance at life. So my brother was also an artist. Even though he was legally blind, he called himself the blind Picasso. He traveled, he did different things, he could draw, he could you know, paint, he could do all of these things, but there was still something lacking the lacking that came where I couldn't reach him before he got there, that hopelessness. And those are some of the things when I thought about fostering greatness, how do we reach these young people before they get to the point where they feel that they have nothing else to live for? Unfortunately, last year on Juneteenth, I received a phone call that my brother had passed away in New York City. And I remember speaking to him a couple months before and he said, Leah, you did everything you could do. I just wanted my mom and dad. So again, how do you get to these young people before they get to that place of despair? So with some of those questions that I had for myself, uh, three years ago, I had a conversation with Andrea, the executive director from PPG. And I said, I don't know where this is going, but I need your assistance. And I'm just grateful, Andrea, for you for taking that chance on us. And um, things began to flourish with Fostering Greatness, Inc. And we were on the uh, platform for the community. People began to inquire, young people began to show up, even older people to talk about their experiences in foster care. And as you guys see the phenomenal Unai up here, and uh, he was able to work with us and some of the young people to do the untold stories of life after foster care. So some of the young people who have been sex workers, some of those who are out in the streets, one young lady who lived a month and a half without electricity with her son and still survived and was able to do some of the things that she did. So you see some amazing people up there, but again, with the little bit of support and the things that we have, we were able to make an impact. We were able to educate people here in the city of Buffalo to be able to get um, a budget line so that we're able to continue to do the support, um, the work that we're doing to support that. And here's just some photos of different things that we've done. Um, and in the back, you see changing the narrative. So with these young people who have gone through the system, we're telling them, you tell us how to change the narrative for you. You tell us what it looks like to make things happen for you. And because PPG has provided that platform with Fostering Greatness, Inc., they feel bold, y'all, they're excited, they're sharing, they're unafraid, and they're advocating for themselves. And when I think about all of the work that we all do, especially with the people on this stage too, that's all we want. We want people to have the tools to be able to say, listen, I'm going through A, B, C, and D, but I know there are organizations or people who can assist me to getting to where I need to go, and the support is real and it's there. So again, some of the phenomenal people that are there sharing their stories and again, having a platform to do that. So these are some of my volunteers, some of my friends, people who believed in me. And as some of the people on the stage said, we had nothing, we didn't start with any money. We just started with a dream and an experience and they supported me. And so look at that, that to me is community. That to me is love and that to me is a start. 
So when we think about reimagining something and what it can be, start with what you have. And don't quit. There are going to be days you're like, listen, why the heck am I even doing this? But then I want you to think about those people who come back to you and say, that day you did A, B, C, and D, that meant the world to me. That I was able to move forward because you did that thing, something that you thought was so small that really helped them to become who they are. And that is more than money. That is more than anything that I can think of holding on to that memory. So as you all are here doing the work, learning more about the work, wanting to be a part of the work, think about your why and what you can contribute to what is being reimagined. And I wanna leave you with that. If you wanna know more about Fostering Greatness Inc., we are on all social media handles as Fostering Greatness Inc., that's I-N-C, and fosteringgreatnessinc.org. So thank you. All right, I'm really excited to hear from our next speaker, and I'm sure after you hear her speak, you will want to hear her speak some more. So please give a round of applause to Ayana McCoy. Thank you, Jillian. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. This has been a really beautiful conference of economic spark and activity, and I'm really happy to bring to you today um, uh, some information and knowledge of my coalition and the work that we do on behalf of a national movement that has come to Buffalo a couple years ago with good reason and has been trailblazing through municipalities all over the state of New York. I'm gonna start with this video here for you guys and I just want you to take sentiment and hear what this woman is saying. When you buy food, you're basically voting with your food dollars for the kind of food system that you want. What if major institutions started doing that with their millions of food dollars and started signaling to the marketplace what kind of food system they want? That's all, just 15 seconds. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not going to take you too far in it. Um, but did you catch what she last said? What if our community started placing intentionally food dollars into the systems and things that we want to see for ourselves and our neighbors, our community. So with that, I want to talk about the state of New York, what our community looks like, what our landscape looks like. I don't know if you guys know, but in the state of New York, we have procurement laws around food and uh, um, agriculture markets and uh, um, procurement systems of public institutions where they are by law required to or you know uh, permitted to work within the standards of having a bid needing a product and seeking out vendors but as long as the uh, bid or the price of the product is all just at, like at most 10% out of the uh, total cost of the product for all that they will be providing for, they are okay to pick any vendor. So that means that there are no other value points based when you pick the person that is providing your food or your beverage, your sustenance in general. So when we think about our public institutions, we're thinking about public schools, we're thinking about our hospitals, maybe nursing homes, we're thinking about, um, you know, anything that you would walk into and your dime, your taxpayer money is paying for your food. So for a couple years now, we have had a good Bill New York in the state of New York and it is pushing for policies by the Good Food Purchasing Policy or the Center for Good Food Purchasing. A couple years ago, people have all across the nation have been coming together and saying, hey, we should be procuring our food with intention. We should be procuring our food with knowledge of what's in our area already, what our community actually needs, and how the people providing these foods and sustenances 
can also equally benefit? How is our system equitable, I would say. So the components of this new bill in the state of New York um, is based off of five values. So we've comprised and we've said, okay, our communities by standard basis would need products that are nutritious, right? So we would expect an vendor to provide something nutritious or something that pertains or caters to our local economies, right? And then what about the workforce behind the production of our products? Are workers okay? Are they making living wages? Or are, they, are, are safety standards um, operating to OSHA standard? You know, those kind of things. Um, environmental sustainability is another thing. Right now, a lot of our institutions procure from big, large farms that do not necessarily um, use organic practices. They don't necessarily have waste production management to high or um, efficient capacity. Um, and then we're also talking about animal welfare. So a lot, <laughs> we, now there's like, I don't know if you see in the supermarkets, you go to the supermarket and you're like, okay, what's the difference between this organic egg and this free rain? What's the difference between free rain and pasture raised? Those are the kind of things that our producers have to consider when they're making our products, when they're taking care of our animals. And these are the kind of values that are inside of this bill that we're pushing for change in the state of New York. So, transforming the way the public institutions purchase food by using these five values implements and trickles into all of our economy and it eventually changes the way we see our food system and the way we exist within our food system. Here in Buffalo, we, the, Buffalo, the Good Food Buffalo Coalition, has come together and we um, have decided that we love these five values and we want to represent the food system and the mycelium workings that we have here in Buffalo. We have local farmers. We have producers and vendors of different proteins and meats. And we have a large demographic of different diverse cultures within Buffalo. All of these people operate within our public institutions. All of these people comprise our community. So here we have um, the fact that um, we represent our students, we represent farm workers, BIPOC business owners, and we, knew, we unite our members to organize themselves within themselves and communicate within themselves, uplift themselves, because that brings the success and the profitability of our economy. Who are we? I keep saying this we. We are an over, we're a 30 member plus organization, but that's institutional members. So we have a lot of these. Take a look at this page and you'll probably see a familiar logo that has maybe had an event for you or given you some kind of knowledge or brought the community together in some way. This is also a list of people that have local farms within the community. This is urban fruits and veggies. This is a female BIPOC farmer in local Western New York, Buffalo. Um, Providence Farm Collective is a group of farmers, immigrant farmers that operate in, I think, Clarence or Orchard Park. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Um, so we have such amazing work going on in Buffalo. Good Food Buffalo Coalition uplifts that work and acts as a center, an intermediary, to continue to provide support to these organizations to continue to do that kind of work. Whether you are a farmer, whether you are a provider, a vendor, whether you're a school or institution, we are that intermediary between both ends of the spectrum. Okay, you guys just bear with me because I did, I just told you guys that, but this is actually a bit written. Sorry. <laughs> Um, but this is like the real breakdown. So this is what I am going to into detail to, to describe to you. Good food purchasing policy is at the center. Good food purchasing policy has drawn and brought out five core values that any person or any community across the nation would want to consider when they're buying their food that would make the success of that city or municipality. 
Then we draw out and we say, okay, hold on. How should we be implementing these five values? What do we wanna see on both ends of the bargain when we come to procure our, our goods and services, right? So we want our customers and our institutions, our public institutions, to act with transparency. We want things to be equitable. And then we want everyone that's involved to have accountability. How do we have that transparency piece if no one is saying, hey, this is my piece, I'm gonna take accountability, I'm gonna hold stewardship of it. So then we go outside of that and we say, okay, how is Good Food Buffalo implementing this? What do we care about? So in light of things that have happened or for, uh, unfortunate and fortunate events that have happened within our city recently, we have to put racial justice at the forefront. So our members said, hey, we need to be thinking about these things more. We want our black farmers, our BIPOC farmers to be represented well within this city. We want them to know about bidding processes. We wanna also think about our, our, our black and uh, indigenous and BIPOC children, right? The biggest things that we're working on right now is our public institution of Buffalo Public Schools. And we think so much about those kids and how we can cater to their needs, cater to their taste buds, their culture within food, and do that responsibly and within the five values. So that's a number of the examples that we do. But um, alongside that, we have a grower, uh, sorry, a BIPOC resource directory, which um, goes out every month and we push out opportunities for BIPOC farmers to become farmers, maintain themselves, access resources, emergency funds of that nature, and we pull those informations together and push that out to our communities within newsletter and email. We have Good Food Build New York advocacy, and with that, we actually just came from Albany, and New York State has passed the Good Food New York bill in the Senate and the Assembly, so we are working on a high. We are pushing forward. <laughs> right? That's great. <laughs> yeah. So within all of the work that we're doing currently and the light of this news, we have to say, okay, what's next? Let's get active. How do we get on? How do we push and implement into our local city, our municipalities? How do we get the mayor to know about this? We take the support, the support of our institutional members, the support of our peers and our peer network across the nation. This is actually a map of how many campaigns across the nation have adopted good food purchasing policy. And as you can see, the state of New York is actually an active campaign. We need to make this completely orange. We need to make this a policy. We, may, we need to make this prevalent and real right now for us within this year because actually we're waiting. The next step is for Governor Hochul to sign the bill and make it, solidify it, codify it into law. So in order to show Governor Hochul that we care about this bill and we're going to use it to the best of our ability, we're moving toward Buffalo Public Schools. The Good Food Buffalo Coalition has been actively working with Buffalo Public Schools, its board members, its director of child nutrition services to see how can we support you, how can we uplift you in the work that you've been doing. Programs like Farm to School, Programs like Saturday Academies, where they've been giving out free produce, we've been attending them. We've been, we worked Juneteenth last weekend as well. We've been asking our community, hey, what do you like to eat? Do you have allergies? What, what are you? What do you consume? These are questions that have not really been asked before by Buffalo Public Schools, and we're getting really transparent answers. We're taking this information right back to Buffalo Public Schools to say, hey, we've evaluated our systems, we've evaluated your levels of procurement. This is what the community needs. How can we find that common ground? So that's what I, I don't wanna bombard you, but I definitely 
want you to understand and I want you to stand with us as we talk about and as we push forward values-based procurement in all, of our, in all of our public institutions. We started with our future Good Food Buffalo Coalition because if you're not feeding your future, you don't have one. So that's that. But if you want to follow the rest of our work, I encourage you to please, if you have your phone, scan this QR code and get active. Um, and maybe even reach out to me on the side. I would give you my email or information um, so that you can figure out how you can also support the movement and contribute your opinion toward changing what you see when you have to use a public institution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we have two more speakers left. This next cause is another cause that's close to my heart for obvious reasons. So let's give a big round of applause to Nando Alvarez Perez. Oh, the founding director, gotta add this, the founding director of Buffalo Institute for Contemporary Art. Hooey, how's it going everybody? Thank you so much for having us. Um, I will admit I'm extremely nervous and I stutter, so just bear with me. Uh, my name is uh, Nando Alvarez Perez. I, I am a uh, co-founder of Bika, um, a, a, along with my partner, Emily, who is in the audience. Uh, so founded in 2018 and now Located on Buffalo's west side, Bika is dedicated to sustaining and empowering Buffalo's creative community through uh, focused and practical engagements with contemporary art. You may know us for our exhibitions, for Cornelia Magazine, which we've uh, published uh, triannually since um, 2019, and um, you can get a new issue on, on, on your way out. For one of our public programs, like Playground, or for our regional uh, regranting program, the Generator Fund. But today, I am here to talk about Beacus School. Launched in June of 2022, uh, Beacon School is a free, collaborative, non-hierarchical co-learning program that is made of, by, and for uh, Buffalo's up-and-coming artists, uh, uh, curators, and researchers. Uh, we now have about uh, uh, 45 uh, participants in uh, weekly attendance. Through critiques, reading groups, collaborative projects, and programs led by, uh, by Bika's exhibiting uh, artists. Um, this was a uh, deep listening workshop on Unity Island with uh, Sophia Cordova, who is right there. Um, participants both learn together and grow their individual practices. We operate Bika School out of a rented space next to Bika that, it, that uh, we call the Bika Lab, um, which is a shared space where participants have all hours access. Um, they can make work there make food there, and host uh, uh, community meetings. And so uh, just in the past month or two, it's been um, lots of meetings of dyke night, and uh, uh, we hosted the uh, AKG's uh, uh, um, union team, too. Uh, Beaker School has become a place for Buffalo's uh, creative community to begin imagining and building a future uh, together and, of course, to have some great parties along the way. 
Um, there's not much that's new about Bika School. Artists have, have, have long sought to uh, better provision them, uh, uh, themselves and, 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 and their communities uh, with varying degrees of um, success and uh, longevity. But as we collectively cope with the fallout of the over-professionalization of arts uh, education and the over-bureaucratization and uh, financialization of higher ed uh, more broadly, the urgent need for alternatives to traditional institutions is clear. Although it's a program of BICA, the school has been self-governed and non-hierarchical since its inception. Uh, BICA is a resource and platform for the school that offers its network as a means to uh, connect BICA schoolers with artists, curators, critics, and audiences. Our goal for BICA school is to create a sustainable mess for free uh, education in art, art history, and uh, 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 critical theory. Bika School is building a community of people who are thinking through ideas and values together. Uh, it is a place where people feel play or don't play. Uh, hold on, I'm on the wrong tab here now. Now I'm on the really wrong tab, so maybe I... Now it just stopped. Hold on. Here we go. Nope, that is not it. Oh well. Okay, so uh, they are. Uh, we, we've uh, the, that that was a slide of. Um, uh, you can go to our site and see all of the um, events that, that they've done in in the past two years. It's uh, movie nights, field trips, uh, more reading groups. Um, uh, and uh, something that I'm forgetting. But just in the last two weeks, Bika Schoolers have published their uh, first piece of art writing, um, opened an exhibition of work in um, uh, the project space that is inside of Bika proper, held an all-ages noise show in the Bika Lab garage, um, and uh, uh, hosted a uh, music and DJ event at Silo City that highlighted uh, queer DJs and performers. Um, and we will be the first to admit that we don't know where Bika School is going. Um, it's, 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 it's been a kind of uh, mobile platform for uh, co-learning, uh, exercising, com uh, 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 com communal governance um, and uh, just a platform to uh, pr provision our, our uh, participants. Um, and uh, I don't have my notes here, so I forgot what I was about to say. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we don't really know where this program is going, but we, we, we could not have imagined the, the amount of uh, uh, engagement that, that we've, we've um, gotten out of uh, the participants. Um, and we hope that by using Bika and Bika School as a platform, Bika School projects can uh, further build out an arts ecosystem in a region uh, where that has largely vanished. Um, and uh, we hope that you will all join us in that work um, and you can start by uh, coming by Bika this afternoon from uh, th 3 to 8 uh, p.m. where we have a just open air art fair, installations, food, drinks, um, misting stations, uh, and uh, you will see a lot of the artists who were, were in these slides. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Okay. Um, we have one more speaker that we want to invite up. This is a very special guest. Um, our final speaker of the day was a close friend and comrade in the work to uh, Mama Gail Wells, who we all know as one of the most transformational, iconic community builders that may have ever stepped foot in our community. Um, so please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Miss Della Miller. Okay, thank you so much. And I have to say, I'm sorry that I missed the majority of the conference. I've been hearing good things about all the good information that was shared with everyone. And um, the panel here, they have been outstanding. The information that I've learned today about the different programs, is, it's, it's awesome to know what's going on in Buffalo. Well, anyway, um, I didn't bring any slides. Uh, there's so much going on with um, Buffalo Freedom Gardens that um, I'm going to ask everyone to use their imagination and go along with me as I just share a few things that uh, Miss Gail and I have um, worked on, completed over uh, quite a long time. I'm not going to give the date away, but it's been a long time. Um, I think what I'd like to just share with you, um, because of her past, uh, for her experience, is how we met. Um, I guess you could say it was with the uh, University of Buffalo uh, had a open call for a program called Champions of Change. And it was partly with the citizen planning school at the University of Buffalo. And we attended um, that particular project. We did not know each other, but um, I, when I first seen her, she was running around this, the room that we were meeting in. She was over there, I said, she knows a lot of people up in here. You know, she was just like a little butterfly flying all around. And, uh, but to my knowledge, she was checking me out too, because I was there every meeting. And she said that when we finally did catch up with each other, she said, you always had those good snacks over there. I know who you are. So um, I would bring little snacks and have my little um, coconut water. She loves coconut water. And uh, so we became close and closer. And we decided that we were going to work on a project together. We both were accepted into Champion of Change, and um, she was working on her gardens, and I was working on a commercial kitchen. And um, as the program was coming towards the end, the uh, dean suggested that Gail and I work together and do combine our two projects together because you have to have um, a kitchen to clean your fruits and vegetables and to do all different kinds of work doing from uh, educating how to grow food to education on how to prepare food with your recipes and things of that nature. And um, it happened to be a great mix. Uh, during that time, um, we would meet just about every other day and we would talk about her project, I would talk about mine, how we can combine it. And um, I really didn't, I really wasn't educated on the growing side of it. And she really wasn't into the cooking side of it. So it was really good. We complimented each other. So it was a really nice thing. Um, we did a lot of research on our projects. We went, um, we went to Cleveland to see uh, samples of what a, uh, garden and commercial kitchen would look like. We went to Toronto to see what it was like. We were just researching anywhere and everywhere we could because we wanted this program to work. Well, in the meantime, we found out that the city of Buffalo uh, was looking for someone to do a commercial kitchen in Broadway Market. 
And um, I talked to Miss Gail and I said, do you think that we could apply for that? She said, I don't know if they're gonna take the garden part, they just want a kitchen. So I applied for the request for proposal and we were lucky to get that uh, contract with the city. And if you've not, if you, if you have not been to Broadway Market, please go. It's a small kitchen, but it's a wonderful commercial kitchen that is, it was made for the community to, to utilize. So that was our first uh, project that uh, we worked on. I think there were about three or, or four other people that were hired to um, do the research and develop the process for the um, commercial kitchen. Then we turned to um, her, her gardening project with the Freedom Gardens and um, whatever she needed done, I did because I was the student. I was really learning about growing and sharing and, get, and, and helping people to become self-sufficient because that's what we had decided our goal would be is to let people become self-sufficient by supplying things um, that will help you to grow your own food. Uh, there's so much to tell. I cannot even give it to you in the few minutes that we have given me today, but I just thought this just, just to share with you the beginning steps of, of the relationship that I had built with my friend, even though we agreed to not agree, believe me, because she could tell you her side of the story. So we agreed to uh, that and we decided that we were determined that no matter what the decision would be, the outcome, it would be that we would be helping people to become self-sufficient in the food area of growing for yourself. Um, from there, um, Gail and I entered quite a few competitions and uh, we were the uh, grand overall winner of Design to Live Sustainably with our commercial kitchen um, and garden project. And um, that was very interesting because there were people applying for from all over the area. And um, we were kind of shocked that we won. We knew it was a good project, but you know, can't overthink it. But we were able to win that competition. And um, because of our, uh, both of us being elders, and we have a lot of experience and wisdom, the younger people kind of like pushed us to the side. But then when the competition came to the end and they realized those elderly women, they know something because they won this contest. And it was, it was, um, a contest where you would share your ideas that worked around air, air planting, um, sustainability, uh, justice, and it was, it was a well-rounded, holistic approach to this particular contest. And it, you can look it up, it's online if you're very interested, because some of the ideas we were able to uh, do now through the um, Buffalo Freedom Gardens. Along with that, um, I can say that the food boxes that the um, Buffalo Freedom Gardens distributed was in 2020, and it was out of the uh, COVID situation. And uh, I believe to today, people are still growing their food, they appreciate it. Um, then in a, uh, alongside of that, Miss Gale was, was accepted into the Buffalo Food Lab for the um, CARES Fellows, which is Community Advisor for Research and Education. And uh, she, it's a one-year fellowship at UB, and we talked to, to the students in the food lab um, that was 21, 22, 
and I am um, the CARES Fellow for 23-24, and I believe I've seen uh, Denise Barr, she's a community advocate. She is the next um, CARES Fellow for 24-25, and I think that that's wonderful. And some of the people that I am mentioning, they are the warriors. They have their boots on the ground, they're digging in the soil, and they're helping people in any kind of way. Um, just as a side note for Ms. Barr, for the work that she does, she has, she has taken the time to gather food for people in her community, and she will walk, because she doesn't have transportation, to take people food. And I think that that's just a marvelous thing. That, that is uh, an exception to the rule, because a lot of people do have transportation, but she is dedicated to that point. And that's what one of the reasons why Ms. Gail and I both um, work with, well, we work in a sense we are connected with people like Ms. Barr and um, Donna Latham. I think I got her name right. They're all hard workers in, in this field, and we all are connected with Buffalo Freedom Gardens in some way or, or another, which is a good thing because we are helping people, as I will always say, be self-reliant. Uh, because my mom said, if you want anything, if you want something done, you do it yourself. And that's what we have to practice. Um, just recently, Gail and I won the uh, educational award for the Western New York Peace Center. Um, that was a few months ago. And because we do our education work around uh, food and growing food and um, a lot of other things that, that we do around that. Um, also, Ms. Gail had a radio show and um, uh, Deidre Emil and I were co-hosts. We did the show for two years, a little over two years, and I miss it already. We're trying to figure out some things as to how we can continue it. Um, and um, that, that's been very interesting. People could call in at some point, and then we also put it on Facebook so people can still obtain that information that we had on each show. And we've had a variety of topics um, because it's a lot to do when you're, when you're trying to grow your own food. Um, Miss Gail had her garden in her backyard and um, I have a container garden on my porch and um, I encourage people that live in small spaces um, that they can grow something, even if it's just tomatoes, if it's just strawberries, whatever, you can grow something. And once you grow the first thing and you taste that green pepper that tastes better than any green pepper you've ever tasted, you're gonna grow more, more peppers, you're gonna grow some mint, you're gonna grow some rosemary, uh, whatever you can in a container. And it's r really easy to do. But the last thing I think I'm, I'm getting up on my time, and I told you all I can talk for a long time about Buffalo Freedom Gardens, is that the um, East Side Garden Walk is coming up in July, 20th and 21st, and I'm inviting everyone to come out. It is online where you can get all the information and the various do uh, locations to go to. Um, also, you can go to buffalofreedomgarden.org for more information about Buffalo Freedom Gardens. And we are in the process of updating our website. So you might see just like the little framework, but the um, uh, website is being redeveloped now. And it will also show the uh, first food forest that it will be in Western New York. And it, is, and it is an exciting program where we're growing fruit and nut trees in the JFK 
Park in Buffalo East Side. So please look forward to that coming. You'll see a taste of it at the um, East Side uh, Garden Walk. It's just in the beginning stages, but Ms. Gail's vision and imagination for that, it's going to be a wonderful place. It will be a destination for people to come to visit and learn and get educated on the benefits of a food forest in Buffalo, New York. Thank you. Thank you to all of our Sparks presenters. Um, we'll give them one last round of applause. We're going to do a couple of things simultaneously. While our Sparks friends are leaving, we're going to be setting up for um, our final musician. I think there might be one person who will be doing uh, closing remarks as that's happening. So one more round of applause as our friends are able to take their seats. Thank you. Welcome to sit down. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting us to things. Leah, good luck tonight. Okay. Um, folks, just quickly while we're setting up, uh, while Curtis is setting up his microphone, I just, thank you so much. I don't know what I'm gonna do with these. I have all the microphones now. I just wanna say thank you all for your patience. Uh, to the gentleman who's running tech, thank you so much also. And I, I wanted to say thank you to all those folks who just presented, all the folks who have spoken to us over the last three days, and all the folks who did incredible work for the past year organizing this conference meeting, way more than they expected they were gonna have to meet. Um, and I'm actually, Curtis, this is gonna take you a second, how long? It'll take you a second. Okay, so I'm actually gonna do this. We were gonna have a little recap with some people. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call in about three people and ask you to tell me one thing that you're gonna take away from this conference, one thing that you remember. And I'm gonna start by telling you a thing that I really remember. I really remember um, that when we were here on the first day that Lauren Jacobs told us all that our ability to change the future was only limited by our imagination. And that is something that I feel like I can carry forward, okay? Does anybody else have a thing that they wanna share with us? Or I'll call on people, because I used to be a teacher. Like I'll call on you, Andrea. What's the thing you're taking away with you? That is fantastic, right? The work is hard and it remains to be done, but we're gonna win. I love that. What's another one? What have you got back there? Somebody's got one. Right, thank you, Kathy. Thank you for all the work, by the way, that you've done organizing this. Yeah, that we have to work together but that conflicts are generative, and let's have them, and then let's let them move us forward. Does anybody else have one? Are you all set? Okay, well then maybe we're just gonna turn it over to Curtis Lavelle. Some of you have had the pleasure of hearing him before. Take it away. Hello. Okay. okay. I will hold you, I only have a couple. Um, Thank you so much for having me here today. This is um, really incredible. It's been really incredible to hear everyone speak. Um, thank you. Okay. 
water thing that never dried, that only filled up with time, thought I was earth, a well grounded thing that always moved but was always accepting. I ain't never been so wrong, ain't never been so sad about being. It ain't never been this dark while watching all of the lights dimming. I made the mind forget the body remembers. I traded my trouble for a moment of tender. I'd give it all again, I'd give it all again, I'd give it all again if you touch like a woman. Ooh. Amazing what the mind forgets the body remembers. I know that there's hope to be had While time is slow, it influences healing Can tell that I'll be dragging it for a while I'll always hear the sound of breaking I ain't never been so wrong Ain't never been so sad about being It ain't never been this dark While watching all of the lights dimming Amazing the mind forgets, the body remembers I traded my trouble for a moment of tender I'd give it all again, I'd give it all again, I'd give it all again, be touched like a woman. Ooh, amazing what the mind forgets, the body remembers.